Hello and welcome back to the Sam Beast YouTube channel. My name is David Foxen and as always before we start please don't forget to like and subscribe. We are growing a lot still and it really does help the channel out when you drop a like and subscribe to us. Today we've got a more relaxed video after the heaviness of the webinars that we've been doing recently and we've got a big interview coming up next week. And this is all spawned from a conversation that I've been having about weird and wacky software licensing models. Obviously, we know all about the open source ones that are out there. And his argument was that when you really actually think about it, IBM and subcapacity licensing is the one of the stranger metrics that he can think of, simply because you've got to do mathematical gymnastics to even start to understand what your requirements are if you're building a new instance, how much is that going to cost, whether it's within budget, whether you've got the spare licenses, etc. All of the subcapacity licensing, the RVU, the PVUs, etc., he claims was when you actually think about it, it's a really weird licensing model. And I thought, you might have a point. I think there's weirder ones out there. We, Like I said, we've done the open source ones. There are a few open source ones as well. But I went off on a flight home and did some research as to other weird and wacky software licensing models. And I would love to know if you've ever heard of these, if you've ever managed a renewal, an audit, a license request, reporting for these kind of licenses. Because some of them are really weird. Some of them you may think that... Un weird nowadays but they didn't used to be weird we'll cover a few of those ones the ones that seem to have phased out quite a bit that now if you're a new ITAM professional joining the industry you would look at it and go that's a weird one but maybe to those that are more experienced you remember that licensing model being quite prevalent back in the day back in my day so I've got my research I've done my note taking uh, and let's have a look through some of these strange ones and I'm going to go back to the open source area because apart from the beer wear and the the dancing one etc there's some other weird open source ones um, that I would love to to know whether you've encountered before. So one of my personal favorites in the open source space that I haven't mentioned before is postcardware. Uh, and this is when you have to send the developer a postcard whenever you use their software. I can't imagine whether this is actually enforced or followed through, but yet under the postcardware license, the developer asks you to send them a physical postcard if you download and use the software. Maybe they're just a collector of postcards and like me with football shirts, they've just got postcards all around their office whenever someone's actually used it. I would love to know if they've ever actually received a postcard for someone using their software. That's a good one. I like that one. There's another one that really caught my eye, which I've not heard of before, is Honestyware. Now, this is another open source licensing model where the developer is saying that if you feel guilty enough for using their software for free, then you can buy a paid for license. Otherwise, it's completely open source and it's free. So yeah, the honesty where is the software runs freely, but the developer requires that you are asked to pay a license if you feel guilty enough. Again, I would love to know if anyone's ever felt guilty enough and you know, you can buy them a coffee or something like that. I wonder if anyone has ever donated some money towards the development or the cause or whether that's just uh, never happened. Two more on the open source ones, just because I think that the creativity on these ones are brilliant. And software licensing is quite a dry, dull subject. But these ones are, are always really good. Um, one that I found as well that really did kind of make me laugh as well. Something called Screamware. Scream as in, ah, where. Um, so this bit of software, by design or by default, has no documentation, no support really badly written code. This is the developer's words, by the way. This isn't like a, a, a review or anything like that. This is the developer's word. So they've got no documents, no supporting documents, no guides, badly written code, and you can use it for free because you'll be paying in blood, sweat, and screams while trying to use it or understand how it works. Brilliant. Love the humor on that one. And finally, something that, uh, again, I found it just really made me laugh was nagware. That's N-A-G-ware, a.k.a. nagging, you know, like, you, why haven't you done this? You need to do this, etc. So, again, the developer's own words. This software will work, but it will nag you every 30 seconds until you pay. Technically, this is real, but it does feel like tortureware. Tortureware sounds uh, horrific, but nagware, love that. Every, the software will work, but every 30 seconds you've got to pop up to pay some money for it. So 
Is it really open source? Maybe the, if you can take the every 30 seconds of nagging to buy a license. But I found that was good. I really did like that one. And I love the open source licensing in there. Some honourable mentions to some weird licensing that may have been more prevalent back in the day, but not really around anymore. Dongleware and dongle licenses. I remember dongles for various weird and wacky uh, software back in the day when I first entered into the item world, where the software would only work when you put the dongle, which was like a USB dongle, into the device. That triggered the license and you could use the software. If you lost the dongle, you lost the license, in effect, and they were really hard to keep a track of and manage. And at the time, ITAM tools and software asset management tools weren't great at being able to track those dongle licenses. You could manage like the, the number of licenses and stuff you had, but a physical dongle, such, such a pain to try and manage or reclaim when people left or they ended up in drawers, etc. You don't see too many dongles anymore and licenses around dongles, but that's a really good honourable mention and one that I actually forgot about because, yeah, like I said, that was such a pain point back in the day, but nowadays everything's you know SaaS or cloud based or user based or device based or some weird ones as we'll find out but dongle based don't really find many of those anymore another one as well that for some reason you know doesn't really feel as prevalent as it used to do back in the day uh, and that's printer based licensing again I remember when we had managed print services and we had specific large printers and stuff like that and the licenses were again based on the per printer it wasn't per user or anything like that or per number of bits of paper used or anything weird like that it was actually per printer and whenever we do uh, manage print services nowadays with the larger vendors it's not really a per printer model anymore all of the support and maintenance for the physical hardware is covered under one contract and any oem software or any additional software that's on that device it's more of a subscription now. It's more based on the number of printers you have on a site now rather than individual ones. So for example, um, you, your site is covered for X amount of printers that you've got in there, not rather than individual ones, if that makes sense. That's what I've been experiencing anyway, rather than actual printer seat license where it's each individual printer must be licensed. Oh, not got the right license for that one. It's not gonna work properly. It's more covered now by the, the geographical area or the organization as a whole. Another licensing model that was you know quite prevalent back in the day especially on um, computer aided design software CAD was uh, per color licensing so if you wanted to do something that used color rather than just black and white you had to pay for additional licenses to be able to do that and in some cases you had to buy additional licenses for each color that you wanted to use again fortunately uh, that's not a licensing model that's very prevalent or very popular anymore uh, Autodesk and other CAD product please don't watch this and start implementing per color licensing for anything that our CAD designers are using because we're, we're, we'll just keep to the per user model at the moment. And, and another one is per metric ton of data. So some IoT and analytics tools, they actually charge based on the tonnage of goods tracked. So that's a wild one as well. You have to track a physical unit of measurement in terms of the weight. So how you'd actually go about doing that, I don't know. ITAM tools, uh, inventory tools, probably can't pick up uh, on things like that. You must have a dedicated solution to be able to do that. But yeah, that's that's a mad one. Imagine trying to manage that one. If you have, I'd love to know how you do that and how you measure that. And maybe monthly in a spreadsheet that you then use with you know, ITAM tools. I really don't know. It'd be great to know that one. Some other unique ones that might be considered quite strange. Uh, we've got per document or per page. So a lot of, not a lot, some document management and scanning software charge per page scanned document or per document processed. So this is when you're literally, you're being, you have to track the amount of pages that you're using via that software or per documents that have been scanned or per documents that have been processed. How you manage that, again, I would love to know whether there's a tool that be able to do that. Otherwise you are, and the, the article says there, there are some surprises at the end of it when you're not tracking it, and you've suddenly got a big invoice from the supplier that provides this licensing type. Um, telephony and call centers, they've got per call or per minute, which I think is still uh, quite prevalent out there. That's still used, I recognize that one. I've had a couple of instances of that. So this is like um, VoIP phones and 
contacts, call centers, etc. They charge the software per minute, per call, or per agent logged in simultaneously. Definitely seen this. There are lots of software where you can see all of the calls that have been logged, the amount of time, how many agents, stuff like that on. And typically, very much like if you've got IBM and ILMT, you have to report on that on a quarterly basis. You're charged for it, etc. You true up, true down based on the flexi license zone, based on the amount of minutes and stuff that you've used. You typically have a high ceiling on the amount of minutes and, and call center workers that you can use at the same time. If you go over it, you've got to pay for it. If you go under it, sometimes that even rolls over to the next month, um, which then if you have an even busier period, you can leverage some of those ones. Some other ones that, again, are still very uh, active and out there is um, per capacity or per storage, terabyte, per gigabyte, etc. Uh, it's based on you how much storage you're physically using with them or even virtually using with them. Not so much as a weird one because that is quite a popular uh, licensing metric now. And again, there are ways in which that you can manage that. You can report and it's, you know, how much you need to buy in terms of that storage and how much you're actively using uh, on a regular basis. And it's really good to work with your internal teams to understand whether there's going to be even more storage going in there. So you need to increase the amount of licenses or license capacity that you'll need for that instance. Another one that they mentioned when we were having this discussion about weird ones, looking way more at the, the well-known corporate straight and narrow ones was uh, SAP's indirect licensing. That was flagged as a strange one. So like, for example, you could be walking past a billboard that's got some SAP software running on it and you've got to track every single person that walked past it and use it because they're accessing it indirectly. There was a big uh, audit case about that years ago. I don't even know if they still do that kind of um, aggressive auditing if it is in a public place and X amount of people can look at it. But it was one where, a, a, I can't remember whether it was a, a commercial organization anyway, used a, a billboard with some advertising. SAP was running in the background of that, which promoted the billboard. SAP said, well, this is in a really popular place. What's the average footfall? How many people typically look up and look at it? They're using it indirectly. You need to buy some licenses from us. Um, which, yeah, again, I don't know whether this is still uh, quite as aggressive as it was back in the day, but I remember when we were working at the ITAM review, that was, um, that was uh, an interesting one. And another one that came up, again, it's not really a weird licensing model, and that's Oracle and Java. Not weird licensing model. It's all of the employees, even if they're not using it or not. That metric itself isn't weird. What is weird is the fact that they've implemented it for Java and are going around and basically auditing the absolute life out of it and finding a lot of people for not having the right amount of Java licenses. Even for a temporary worker that comes in on a Friday afternoon, they'll need a license for it. Not really a strange model, but a strange approach on how they're going about it. And finally, the stranger licensing models that are very industry environment dependent on. Uh, first of all, looking at the aviation industry. I love hearing about all of these. I'm not a plain guy by any stretch of the imagination, but I love hearing about these weird licensing models. Just having a look through some of the software providers that work in the aviation industry. We've got per tail number, which is basically per aircraft. So this is relating to flight planning, uh, software or maintenance systems that are licensed per aircraft registration. Doesn't matter if it, the license type is the same, it says, the cost is the same. If the plane is a jumbo jet or an Airbus or a tiny Cessna plane, each tail number requires a separate license. Really interesting. Per flight hour, so certain maintenance and tracking software and predictive analytics platforms charge based on how many hours your aircraft flies. So your license requirement and your spend in your bill literally goes up every time you go in the air with that particular plane. We've got some other really useful ones in here like per data feed for weather-based software and aviation, per update cycle. We've got some that are per boarded passenger for commercial airlines. So if you carry more people, the software requirements in your software bill goes up. So if you're a smaller airline, for example, you're probably paying less on this software because you're carrying randomly 120 people per plane. But if you've got those mega Airbuses with multiple floors and stuff like that, and you're carrying hundreds upon hundreds of people, your bill's gonna be more expensive than that. So interesting, really, really cool to do this. And I, if you've ever got time, you know, I said this when we did the open source video, but if you've got time, just have a look, go out there and Google weird licenses in, in industries that you're not familiar with. And just understand what some of this kind of stuff does and how you would manage it. And if you are managing it, please let me know. I'd love to know how you're doing that with your ITAM solutions. But we have one, the final one, the creme de la creme. And this is in the farming world. And this is a legitimate license. Okay. Are you ready? 
So the the weirdest license that I could find in the amount of time that I was doing the research was per named cow. That's right, cows that go moo. Per named cow. And I'm going to have to read my notes for this because it's actually quite a lot to it. It's not quite as easy as you as, as you might think. So the per named cow licensing model is typically found in yeah, our agricultural and farm management software. It's dairy herd management and livestock ERP systems that structure licenses around the number of cows you are managing in the system. Every cow, if you think about it, has an asset tag. No, they don't have an asset tag. That's very ITAB. They have an ear tag if they're a, a commercial cow being used. An asset tag, imagine. Well, it's basically like an asset tag. But every cow has an ear tag anyway, which is a unique identifier. So you need to structure your licenses around the number of licenses that be number of cows that are being managed in this system. And because each cow has an ear tag, passport, or unique ID, the license is per named cow. So you can relate that ear tag or that passport or unique reference for that cow into the system so that you know how many licenses you need. Wild, wild. So typical examples of some of the software and it's more than one type of software in this. So herd, herd management systems, this is used for tracking milk yields, health records, breeding cycles and veterinary treatments. You've got the farm ERP systems that include livestock modules, also the transferring of livestock to other owners or other farms, etc. You've got genetics and breeding software where each cow in the herd has to be tracked individually. This is mad. I'd love to, again, please, if you've ever had to do this, please let me know. I'd love to see how you're managing this in your item tool. Uh, and dairy production and optimization tools that monitor the feed to yield efficiency per cow. So instead of it being per user or per server or per device, etc., the, the license in some cases when you're actually purchasing the amount literally says license valid for X amount of cows. There's different options in there. I can't believe this is what we're talking about licensing per cows, but it's great. It's so interesting. And then some structures that we found, there are actually tiered on the amount of cows that you've got. Uh, and you actually need additional licenses if you reach a certain threshold, whether you've got over 250 cows, 500 cows or 1,000 cows. Believe it or not, yeah, the licensing uh, cost does come down in that case. This makes a lot of sense. One of the case studies on the website was that um, obviously then a, a farmer with 40 cows pays for less licenses than a commercial dairy farmer with over 10,000 cows. It is a per cow licensing model and you have to factor all of that in um listen i really hope you found this humorous interesting maybe even useful um, i certainly had fun researching this and we'll continue to do this uh, whenever these conversation crops up every time when you sit there and go that's a weird licensing model and then you go ha i think i can find weirder ones if you know of an even weirder licensing model please let me know in the comments or over on linkedin if you've ever used any of these software that requires strange licensing types like we've mentioned here or other ones please, please, please get in contact with me. I'd love to have 30 minutes of your time just to discuss how you're managing it, how you're tracking it, how you're renewing it, whether they do any audits or anything like that. So please do let me know. Other than that, hope this gave you a bit of light relief for your week. Have a lovely rest of your week. We'll see you back here next week for our big interview for October. And until then, happy eye tamming and happy inventorying of per-named cow. <laughs>